Hello and welcome to Inside Cottonwood. I'm your host, Doug Bartosh, also your city manager. And I'm here today with uh, Police Chief Jody Fanning, who has notified us that uh, he's planning to retire on January 22nd of 2016. And we're in the process of uh, replacing him, if that's possible. And um, I thought it would be interesting to, to uh, kind of uh, talk to Jody about his plans, but uh, more importantly, to go back in history and, and uh, kind of get his perspective, because uh, he's been in the community now for how long? 29 years. 29 years, so almost 30 years. So uh, you started in 1987? It, well, started with Cottonwood PD in 80, May of 87. I started my law enforcement in, in, in 1986. Yep, up in Flagstaff. Up in Flagstaff. So in 1987, how was the department different than yeah. it is today? Uh, well, it was it was still very uh, very rural and very behind the times on technology, training, staffing, equipment, facilities. Uh, everything was way different back then. A lot different. And I can imagine that the population back then was probably somewhere around five thousand. I think five or six thousand. Uh, yeah, it was it was pretty small. So. And then um, you guys weren't in the building that you're in now. No, we were all in what is the finance building now. That was the entire police department was in the building that the finance department is in, which included the two jail cells in the back, um, the kitchen for cooking food for the prisoners. Uh, the safe where we kept our evidence. We had a office for our detectives and an office for the chief, an office for the secretary and dispatch, and then an office for the sergeants. Okay. And, and who was the chief that hired you back then? That was Tom France. Um, he was the, uh, the chief at that time. He had come from, I believe he was from Scottsdale. He was a, a chief from Scottsdale or Somewhere down south, I can't remember. It was a few years ago. Okay. Yeah, because I know Finch came from Scottsdale. Yeah, Scott Finch came from Scottsdale, I mean, but I, I want to say that France did. He may not have, but he was, uh, I, he was from somewhere down south. Okay. And then, um, you know, you say you had a jail or had a couple cells, and back then you didn't have the Camp Verde jail like we have today. Do no, they... we had a, a jail cell or two over there, um, but for the most part, any prisoner that we needed to book into jail, all females and all juveniles had to be taken over to Prescott. Uh, we still have to take juveniles over to Prescott, but females had to go to Prescott, and if there was more than three or four, everything had to go to Prescott. Okay. You had to drive them over there. Okay, and then, um, so, I imagine back then there were a lot of nights you worked by yourself, isn't it? Yeah, there was. Um, when I first got off FTO, there most of the nights, other than occasionally a Friday or Saturday night, that would be just me. Um, Camp Vert or Clarkdale usually went home uh, around midnight. Uh, there was no Sedona Police Department. There was no Camp Verde Marshal's Office. Um, it's quite funny because a actual, my backup most of the time was Sheriff Scott Masher. He was the road deputy for the um, Eastern Ops. Um, so he had all of the Verde Valley and it was generally him by himself. So he had Village of Oak Creek, Sedona, Camp Verde, the villages, Cornville, Rimrock, and um, and all everything in between and then me. So it was him and I. So. So I assume you backed him up a lot all over yeah. the Verde Valley. As, yeah, wherever as well. he needed me because that that was it. We were the only ones out there. They t Sometimes they'd have two on, but very rarely more than two. Um, but yeah, it was just us. And then Camp Verde was in the process of developing their marshal's office, and Sedona was getting ready to get started on theirs, but neither one of them had officers yet. Okay. And then um, how about DPS? Where they oh, they went home at 11. Uh, okay, <laughs> and so, I was always graveyard. I was the rookie. The rookie went to graveyards. That's where you went, and that's where you stayed. So, how long did you work graveyards uh, for? About four years, five years before I seen sunlight. Okay. So. Right. 
Do you, do you remember a lot of the people you worked with back then when you uh, first yeah, started? Yeah, yeah. There was I. I remember most of all all of them. Um, some of them ended up retiring from here. Um, some of them, you know, Ace Fick was one of my sergeants. He used to pick on me because he said that I was a runaway juvenile because I looked so young, um, and he was just trying to find where my mom was to get me home. Um, and uh, Rod Antone was one of my sergeants. He was also an officer when I first started. Keith Porter was one of my sergeants who ultimately became one of our lieutenants. Um, Bob Steffick, who went up to Sedona. Dana Schmidt was up in Sedona, moved from here and went up to Sedona. Um, there was a lot of um, people, you know, Bill Martin and, and uh, uh, Lloyd Wolf and Danny Scott, obviously, they, you can't, nobody can ever forget Danny Scott and Dean Summers. Yeah, they were, we were all here, there, but there was only 12 or 13 of us when I started, 11 of us. Okay. So. And then, um, so at, at what point did, um, did uh, you guys move into the new building? The new building didn't come until, 12 years ago, so it had been about 2002. Okay, so, so you you were in the building down in Old Town for quite a while. Yeah, they ultimately bought, um, the city ultimately bought where the city magistrate or the city clerk is and the city council chambers are at. They bought that building and they allowed us to have a back portion of it, which was the, we called that the patrol annex where the patrol officers had our computers and stuff because we were starting to move forward in technology and we actually had a computer. Um, so we had that room over there where patrol was at and then the detectives and um, the chief were in the other building. And then, um, so how long was uh, Chief France here? Chief France, uh, he was only here for a couple of years after I got started, and then he left. Um, he was not a very um, political, un he did not understand politics, and he sometimes would say things that probably shouldn't have, may have been correct, but probably shouldn't have said it. So uh, he didn't last very long. It was a, it was a different community back then. So. And then uh, the next chief was? We had some interim chiefs. Uh, a lieutenant wrestler from um, the Department of Public Safety was here for about a year and a half while they, and before we got um, Chief Finch, um, Roy Finch, who was here for, he was here for quite a while, I want to say six maybe years, maybe a little bit less, um, but he was here. He was from Scottsdale. He was, a, I believe, a captain in Scottsdale, um, and he was here. And then after he left, we had another interim, which was Lieutenant Porter for a while until we got um, Pat Spence. Okay. And, and Pat came from Clarkdale, right? Yeah, he was originally, he was with Cottonwood, then he went to Clarkdale, where he was a police officer, and he ultimately became the city manager and the police chief, um, and then he came to Cottonwood as the police chief. So did he start in Cottonwood as a That police was my officer? understanding, as, no, as a dispatcher. He was a dispatcher. Dispatcher? Yeah, huh. for, for Cottonwood, and then he went over there, so. Okay. So, um, who was the one that, that, and I guess the, the more important question is, what was Old Town like back then? Uh, you, you pretty much, you rolled the sidewalks up at eight o'clock. There was nothing happening. Um, most of our criminal, a lot, well, a lot of our criminal activity was moving around down in Old Town. Uh, there was just, uh, you know, a lot of nothing hap nothing good happening after 8 o'clock because there was nothing open other than, well, it was the Buckaroo Bar and um, now it's Cactus Kate's and stuff like that. That was about the only thing that was really open after dark down there. So, and the Moviola, uh, or the movie theater, the Old Town Movie Theater, it was open, uh, but that was pretty much it. So once the movie let out, then all you had was the bar and bar fights and, you know, and other stuff, burglaries. We had the Sheps, where the law, Lead Better Law Firm is, is was a, a liquor store, um, which got burglarized quite a bit. Um, I actually got to watch them burglarize it once, so. Um, yeah. did, you, did you catch them? Oh yeah, we caught them all. We, I happened to be doing a foot patrol and listen to the kids planning it all out, and while I was waiting for officers to get there to back me up, they broke into it, and come running out and there was a bunch of police officers standing there so 
they didn't work out so well for them. So they in there mostly steal booze and booze and cigarettes. Yeah. Okay. So um, and you talk about the theater and that's what is the tavern grill yeah. today. Yeah. No, which was... burned down in uh, ninety. When was that? In nineties. Yeah. Yeah. It was probably the late nineties. Yeah, it was the late nineties. I don't remember what year. Yeah. So, I remember I was on. I had to block traffic forever, but <laughs> that was it. Well, let's go ahead and take our first break, and then we'll come back and get a little more history about the uh, Cottonwood Police Department. one of the elemental privileges of a free people, endowed as our nation is with abundant physical resources and inspired as it should be to make those resources and opportunities available for the enjoyment of all, we approach re-employment with the real hope of finding a better answer than we have now. Donate to Goodwill, where your donations help fund job placement and training for people in your community. Welcome back to Inside Cottonwood. I'm your host, Doug Bartosh, and I'm here with our police chief, uh, Jody Fanning, who uh, is retiring in January, and we're kind of going back uh, through his career, which is also an interesting historical perspective of uh, the city of Cottonwood and uh, Cottonwood Police Department. So beyond Old Town, what was the rest of the city like then? I, I know you didn't have Home Depot. You might have had... We didn't have Walmart. No Walmart. We didn't have Giant. Uh, we didn't have Taco Bell. We didn't have anything. Matter of fact, the we called it the Y because the road split at 89A and well, it was 279 back then. They renamed it to 260, and you had a split right there. So you, if you stayed straight, you would go to Sedona. If you took the split to the right, you went to Camp Verde, and it was a stop sign for you to turn on to Main Street if you were coming from Camp Verde. Um, so you didn't, you know, they, they only faced the traffic that was going to and from Sedona. And so it, the Chamber of Commerce actually sat in the center of the little island. You went behind, this, behind it and in front of it. So that was pretty interesting. We only had the stoplight, at that time the only stoplight was at um, Main and 89A. Um, so the bypass was yeah. in place at that time. Yeah, but it was only a two-lane road all the way out. And it was okay. it was a very narrow road, um, all the way across. You had the what now is the uh, Evergreen, where the Evergreen Hardware was, and our electrical, and now the Mission Store is. That was the roller skating rink, um, which is where we had the four kids get ran over one that one year, and, and a couple of them died from that. Um, hmm. Walking home from the roller skating rink. Now, where was the roller skate rink? It's right there, right where the Maverick is now. It's right across the street where that oh. church is at, um, and the um, Old Town Mission oh, okay. thrift store is at. Okay. That was the roller skating rink, um, and it was kind of out of town. It was a little bit different because there was no Maverick. Uh, obviously, Tractor Supply Company wasn't there, and it was just set Cottonwood out there. Cottonwood Ranch wasn't there. Well, nothing was out there. The airport was there, but there wasn't anything around the airport, so it kind of was sitting out there all by itself, but it was the roller skating rink. Hmm. Um, so you had two Circle Ks. You had North and South Circle K, which is the North Circle K, which is what we called North Circle K, is now the UPS store. Um, and then you had two Woodies, which the one Woodies is where Walgreens is at now. So that was that was pretty much it. I remember my my first Christmas working for Cottonwood PD. There was there was literally no place to eat because nothing was open other than Circle K, 
So um, at the time, my wife didn't live here, so I had a frozen bean burrito at Circle K for Christmas dinner. <laughs> I just didn't know what I was going to do with life from now on, having frozen green burritos for dinner. Um, but that was the only thing that was open. We did have a McDonald's, but it wasn't open on Christmas. Um, th that was not happening. There was nothing else open. So, so um, and then um, in terms of, well, obviously no place to eat at night. Um, how about the rest of the city? I mean, were there hot spots where you, you had to respond to often? Uh, yeah, um, there was a, a, a apartment complex, which is now a very respectable com uh, complex, which was Mingus uh, View Apartments or on 740 East Mingus. The, the standard at that time, there was, they, uh, they had no lease options. You could rent month to month. Well, criminals love month to month. So if there was a crime, I, and I listened to the scanner for the sheriff's office all the time, if there was a crime, I would just go wait at the intersection to their apartment complex, and nine times out of ten, the criminal would drive in there because that's where they all lived. I mean, they were, it was pretty regular that they were in and out of there. And it was, yeah, that was our, that was our hot spot for fights, other than our bars. Uh, our bars were still very Western, and there was a lot of fighting at the bars. So you talked about um, the bar in Old Town. What, what were some of the other? Well, you had the Corral Bar, which is across from um, where it's right next to the Thai place um, at Maine and, Asp Maine and Aspen. Chaparral Bar is always there. You had the Prospector, which is where the bonsai um, Chinese food is. Um, okay. And then um, Rusty's was up there off of the bypass. Um, that was pretty much it. The old town, Corral, Chaparral, Prospector, and Rusty's. Those were the five main places. And you just, whichever place filled up that night was where the fights were going to be. Was, that's what, that was what you had to do, was go to the bar and get in a fight. Now, somebody told me that the, the restaurant at the Quality Inn used to be kind of a hot spot to go at night and, and. The, oh uh, yeah, that, well, yes. I don't was, remember what it was called. What um, the, I don't remember what it was called either, but that was, that was, uh, that was a different group of people. It wasn't the, the, there was a hot spot, but it wasn't a hot spot for fights. And fights, but there was, um, that was where more of the um, business owners and doctors and stuff like that tended to hang out. Um, a lot of our old then, back then, council members, that's where they, you would find them, um, that type of stuff. Huh. So, so um, what was the most memorable call you ever got, bad or good? Uh, most memorable call, oh, wow, there was so many of them. Um, probably the one that I will never forget is it, it was a, uh, I had found a, tra made a traffic stop on a tractor trailer and um, during the contact with the tractor trailer driver, it was very obvious that the, he was not going to comply with anything I had to say. He had um, what we call dead eyes. His eyes kind of just looked right through me. Um, he wouldn't get out of the trailer tractor or anything else. While I was dealing with him, I found out that um, Jerome PD had impounded the tractor the day before. He had broke into the impound lot and stolen the tractor trailer back. Um, when I tried to take him out at gunpoint, he just drove off. Uh, we ended up in a pursuit uh, with him all the way up to um, through Camp Verde and up the mountain towards Payson. Um, he was hauling plywood, and during the pursuit, the straps to the plywood had come loose, so the plywood was coming off at the patrol cars like giant Frisbees, so we were dodging plywood. Um, Department of Public Safety shot the radiator out at the, on the tractor trailer. And then um, he got, he was going up a hill on the other side of Camp Verde, and it, the engine finally blew out from not having any water. So he threw it in neutral and he jumped out and let the tractor trailer roll back and crash into the patrol cars. And then he ran off into the desert. <clears throat> Myself and uh, uh, one sheriff's office, sheriff's deputy, Zane Simmons, and a Cottonwood police another Cottonwood police officer, we chased him into the desert. We ultimately caught up to him. And the thing I, I remember the most is I was standing there face to face with him after I'd watched him fall off about a, close to a 50 foot cliff. 
and I'd gotten to him and I was pointing my gun at him and I told him to, that I was going to place him under arrest and drop the rock and he says, and he looked at me and he told me that there was only one way that both of us were walking out of there tonight and that was for me to turn around and walk away. And I told him, well, I have the gun and he looked at me and said, that's never mattered to me before. And it sent a shiver down my spine. Um, Zane Simmons showed up right after that. He's a very large police officer, very strong, very stout. Um, I remember watching Zane punch him with everything he could and he turned and looked at Zane and he says, now that's going to piss me off. And then all I seen was Zane's shoes go by my head because he hit Zane so hard that he completely knocked him upside down. And the fight was on and he, he beat us bad for a while and then for some reason, Fred Greer was able to talk him into letting us put handcuffs on him for a cigarette, and I don't know why he did it, but he did. Um, and when he was set to be sentenced to go to prison, or before, when we found out who he was, he had been in Folsom Prison. The day he got released from Folsom Prison in California, he killed two of his cellmates, and um, before they could figure out that he had killed them, he was already out the gate. So he was wanted for two murders in Folsom. On his way here, he got into a fight in um, Barstow, California, and he, he put five police officers in the hospital and he called 911 and told them to send an ambulance but not to send any more police officers. And uh, he, was, he was a Aryan Brotherhood and his, his specialty in the prison system in California was police handgun takeaway and police assault. And, uh, that one, that one shook me up pretty bad because I realized that I came really close to having the end of my career be that side of that mountain that night. Yeah. But for whatever reason, he decided to go to jail that night and not just go ahead and kill us. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and and while that was probably a a real uh, shattering one in terms of your own safety, I know you've had to handle some tough cases too, like the Marisol Gonzalez case. I think you were. Uh, responded to the initial call on No, I didn't get to, I wasn't on the scene of the initial call. I was there the next day. Um, I was out of town that day, but I was, I was called in the next day and I was a patrol corporal at the time and I was assigned, immediately assigned to investigations to uh, work with Detective Postra and at that time Sergeant Scott and that was our only thing. Our only assignment for the next eight months was working on that case and it was a very long time. I never, that one I will never forget either, that one. I'm so glad that we finally have Cecilio facing charges. We knew we, Cecilio did it from the very first day that we, we started the investigation. We just could not get the evidence that we finally needed to convince the people to let us take him to trial. So it's, it's a, uh, it's a very, good feeling to have before I leave to have him finally facing a jury to, to tell us to, so they can see what he did to that girl. Okay. Let's, let's go ahead and take our, uh, our second break and uh, again come back and join us and we'll uh, grill Chief Fanning a little bit more.
Welcome back to Inside Cottonwood. I'm your host, Doug Bartosz, and we're here with Chief Fanning, who is uh, planning to retire in January, and we're kind of picking his brain on uh, some of the, the uh, more memorable uh, incidents that uh, he went through in uh, uh, the police department here. I, and one of the other ones I know uh, really impacted the department and I know you were involved in was, uh, uh, and it was right before I I got to Cottonwood, was the accident down on 260. And, oh, with Pastor Hutchison? Yeah. Yeah, that one, I didn't like that one very much. Pastor Hutchison was, A, a he was our department chaplain. B, he was my my chaplain or my pastor at my um, church that I attended at the time. And uh, when I rolled up there, nobody knew who was involved in the accident. And I walked up and I seen Pastor Hutchison. And for anyhow, I was able to identify him. And uh, that one rocked my world pretty bad to see all of those people because I was very good friends with all of them, the whole family. And yeah, I did that one. That one rocked the whole department, the whole Verde Valley as it should, um, but it, I didn't like that one very much. That's the sad, the hard part about a small town is, and I'm still dealing with it, where you roll up just like the cheerleaders, you roll up on a scene, there's a high probability you're gonna know at least 50% of the people involved personally, and it, gets, it wears on you after a while. You know, and and that's so true. And and I think one of the things I've I've appreciated uh, about a small department and and people like you who've been here for so many years, because um, I, I remember one of the first calls that that uh, I got involved in when I was here was a homicide um, just back behind uh, the police department at one of the apartment complexes and and. Uh, it was amazing how quickly the officers start identifying potential suspects. And, uh, you know, and again, I think uh, what came home to me on that call is how important it is to work with your surrounding agencies because you, as a small agency, you just don't have the resources to handle something like that on your own. Yeah, I, I actually, I think I remember ask, you asking where our crime scene techs were and uh, myself and Sergeant Gildahas telling you we're standing right here because we don't have crime scene techs like <laughs> you had in Scottsdale. Uh, yeah, you have to work with the surrounding agencies and, and you have to pay attention to your community. It, it, it was easy because we do know everybody. Um, we deal with them, we see them, we know them personally, their friends, whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important to to work with the outside agencies and to pay attention to your community. Yeah, I don't. I think that was a couple of days after I'd asked for the uh, the bomb dog to come out and check us. Yeah, and I advice. think Sergeant Gildahas barked at you that time <laughs> um, because he was going to be the bomb dog you were going to have to send up there to find out if it was a real bomb. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it was interesting. Yeah, uh, definitely a, a change of uh, culture coming from uh, Scottsdale with some 500 police officers up here to where we had about 30. So yeah, maybe 30 at that time. It was a change. But in in looking back and, uh, you know, the time you've spent here and obviously the relationships you made through the department and in the community, um, what's your fondest memory? Ah, fondest memory. <laughs> there's so many of them. I mean, there's just, I, the, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's just so many of them. I think the best times I've had is just the dealing with the kids and stuff. You know, my times where I'm down at the fields and stuff like that, um, and the kids recognizing you and playing with them and stuff like that. And yeah, I've won a bunch of awards from the Elks and stuff like that, but those don't mean as much to me as, as just, I think, I don't know. My fondest, I have to just say my fondest memory is just being a part of this town and this, and this community with these people, it's, they're amazing. Um, there's no one specific thing I can really think of off the top of my head. Well, and that's, you know, I think that's another thing I've always appreciated about you. It's clear to me how involved you've been in the community because as, you, as I've walked around the city with your Bennett locations, you seem to know all the kids. And yeah. it seems like you've coached them in one thing or another. 
all the time. And unfortunately, some of those kids you didn't coach, you had probably yeah. negative contacts with them, but they, they always seemed to respect you regardless of of what the contact was. Yeah, I yeah I, I learned after a couple years in my career that I could get far more from with honey than I could with the, the strong arm of the law. And it, it did take me, I'll, I'll admit it, my first few years I was, uh, I was a little cocky. Um, and it took me a while to learn that I could do much better the other way. And now then, yeah, it is neat because I do see some of the kids that I did have po contacts with law enforcement wise that were able to change their ways and come back. Um, there's one kid in, spe in particular that um, he now coaches kids and he was a little turd quite honestly but you know he he tells me all the time at least you treated me like a human mm -hmm. you know I did things wrong but you treated me right and now you know I, I have a lot of respect for him because he, he did turn himself around and those are the things that I remember the most, you know, that those type of encounters. Um, but yeah, and having my four kids, they, you know, they were so involved with so many things, which I was blessed to have them involved in. And that's what got me more involved with the kids and around them because my kids were always involved in something, 4-H, clogging. Yes, my kids clog. Um, <laughs> I won't tell which one because they'll get in trouble. Um, but yeah, we were everywhere. Now that'll that's a secret. We'll have to I'll <laughs> yeah. have to figure out because yeah. that's that's good for a ribbing. Well, if two. she finds out that I told, then she'll uh, she'll probably hurt me. <laughs> so, well, I'm trying to think of the one. There's that's three most of them. Likely so. to hurt you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, we're out of time, unfortunately, because I'm sure we could we could probably go on for a couple hours here talking about. Uh, your experiences and where it's been, and, and certainly uh, the community owes a, um, a real debt and a thanks to Chief Fanning and, and uh, the best wishes to him in the future, uh, regardless of what he chooses to uh, take on. And I know his plans at this point are to stay in the community, so um, we'll still look forward to seeing him uh, around the community at Starbucks in the morning. He's <laughs> down there every morning. Not every morning. <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you for joining us. Um, we do have some uh, celebration coming up to recognize his retirement. And uh, I don't know if I have the date and time, but um, uh, yeah, I, uh, we'll, we'll, city, we'll I get know. it out to the public. So those of you who have known uh, the chief for a long time can come and help us uh, recognize his contributions. Thanks for joining us on Inside Cottonwood and come back and uh, join us again. Thank you very much also. For